Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 34, through chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gebeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord was sorry that the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I named to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked at Elab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinabada and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, Oh, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then sent out and went to Ramah. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe at once, he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can I compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests 
in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. May God add blessings to the reading, the hearing, and the interpreting of God's holy word. Our Old Testament lesson this morning, we hear a big leap in this cycle of readings about the prophet, the judge, Samuel. You'll recall last week, if you were here, you got to hear about Samuel being called to serve God as he was serving his predecessor in the temple. And how it was only when he was able to sit and listen in quiet for the still small voice of God that he recognized who he was to become, who he was called to be. And at that point turns his life to serve God fully. One of the first major acts that Samuel does following several years of serving God is to anoint the first king. He's called upon to anoint Saul. And Saul is a great warrior. He's able to defeat many of the enemies of the Israelites and is able to make the beginning of the nation, transforming it from what was still a semi-nomadic confederation into an actual solidified kingdom. And yet Saul, in his power, eventually became distracted and pursued other ways. And the Lord decides that he will cut Saul off. And that's where the story today picks up with Samuel, who is grieved, brokenhearted with his disappointment with how Saul has developed as a king. And God tells Samuel, stop your caterwauling. I have made a decision and you are to go and I will show you who will take Saul's place. And as we hear, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse. Seven big strapping sons are paraded by him. And yet, God tells Samuel, no, these are not the ones I've chosen. And finally, asking Jesse if he has another son, well, my youngest is out in the field tending the sheep. Call him. And young David, the scrawniest of the group, is the one that God chooses. Again, as the scripture tells us, God does not see things the same way that we do. What looked big and powerful and potential for kingship to Samuel is not who God was going to choose. Something small, something unexpected, out of which God will grow what would become the greatest king in Israel's history. Then we get to the gospel today, and we get that same theme. 
from the smallest of seeds grows a great shrub. Next slide. This gives you some idea of what a mustard seed looks like. And yet it's actually much smaller than that. Next slide. This is what comes out of that seed when it's tended and allowed to grow. <laughs> something tiny, and yet something great, emerges out of it through the hand of God. Go ahead and throw the next slide. Figurative, but we see the birds that are able to take shelter there. Again, this whole idea of something small growing into something great. And how many of us have the tendency in our day-to-day -day lives to think, that we are something small. We forget that that same potential seed that God has packed with this ability to grow so large is planted in us. What are we doing to nurture and grow that seed? Theologian Matthew Fox talks about and develops an entire theology around the idea of creation, small things becoming great. Indeed, much of his writing, much of his theology is often referred to as creation spirituality. It's that creativity that he argues is what is held within that seed within us. And not only is it a seed, it's the image of God. We talk about the Imago Dei, literally, the image of God. Fox argues that each of us carries not only that image, but the ability to create just as God creates. And he draws upon a wealth of literature with which he develops his ideas. Let me give you just a brief sample. Because he, he draws from modern writers all the way to the ancient mystics in scripture. This piece comes from Albert Einstein. The greatest formal talent is worthless if it does not serve a creativity which is capable of shaping a cosmos. Dog Hammarskjöld, who was the second Secretary General of the United Nations raises the question, do you create or do you destroy? Dorothy Day, the journalist and social activist, states that God is our creator. God made us in his image and likeness. Therefore, we are creators. The joy of creativeness should be ours. If we go to the, to the great mystics of the church, Meister Eckhart, the German mystic, says, the soul among all creatures is generative like God is. One of the other female 
German mystics, Bechtild of Magdeburg, proclaims, we shall have a creative kingdom. The great abbess mystic, Hildegard of Bingen, humankind, full of all creative possibilities, is God's work. Humankind alone is called to assist God. Humankind is called to co-create. With nature's help, humankind can set into creation all that is necessary and life-sustaining. If we leap back one more time to the Gospels, John recalls Jesus telling the disciples, it is to the glory of God, my Father, that you should bear much fruit. And this will prove you are my disciples. I commissioned you to go out and to bear fruit, fruit that will endure. All of this material, if we believe that we are indeed made in the image of God, tells us that we are also creators. We are intended to assist in the creation of the kingdom of God. Establishing that kingdom where everyone has a place and where everything is filled with beauty. And I would suggest that this is also the core to sainthood. When we live out that image that we are made in, we live out the sainthood that we were intended to fulfill. Unfortunately, we live in a time and probably every time that has trouble with the concept. We have challenges. Why are we not more creative? How many of you remember at some point in time in society being told that only special people can be saints or be truly creative? How many times when you were in school did you hear someone tell you, you can't sing, you're not musical, you can't draw, you can't paint. You can't write well. Your poetry is subpar. You can't this, you can't that. We've all heard those things at some point. So how do we overcome it? The question becomes, what are we planting? What are we creating? And it all begins when we take that silent moment every day to listen for the still small voice. It's coming out of that voice and its message that we are guided to greater consciousness, a greater ability to manifest our own creativity. It reconnects us to our original self, the image of God. It is the fertile ground that allows the seed of creativity to grow, sprout, and blossom. How do we nurture and grow small to great? It's not physical, but it's the depth 
and the wisdom that we develop within each one of us. It's taking time to plant little seeds. And the seed may not be a plant, it might not be a garden. It's figurative, it's metaphorical. But what are we planting? And how are we nurturing and growing it? Every little thing we do, every little seed we plant, helps advance God's kingdom. Jesus tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. And whoever remains in me and me in them bears fruit abundantly. We are co-creators of the kingdom. In spite of all that society and culture tries to tell us, we have inherent creativity and artistry within us. If you nurture that tiny little seed, if you nurture that mustard seed within you, what might happen? If you plant and nourish tiny seeds of creative actions, what might happen to the growth of God's kingdom? From tiny, small beginnings, the kingdom expands and grows. Amen.